Alim. Tufan sir, shall we start now? Uh, yes, sir, let us start now. It is already 8th no Yeah. So, good evening and welcome all of you to this 27th edition of Thursday Musings. Next slide, Tufan. And let me introduce Professor Dr. Tufan Pati, sir. Mm. He is from Katak. He is very well known to all of the National Advisory Board members. And he's indicating me to stop his introduction and hand over to him. Uh, sir, uh, over to you, Tufan, sir. Okay, thank you, Alim. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. Pavan. So we have got to it, I have got with me two stalwart psychiatrists of our country. Both of them are direct members of IPS. And both are vibrant, both are young, and both have a lot to give to the IPS and psychiatry. Dr. Amrit Patadosi Bhuvneswar, he is a professor and chief consultant of neuropsychiatry in High Tech Medical College. And Dr. Amrit Patadosi, he is a neuropsychiatrist. And Dr. Alim Siddiqui is visiting professor of psychiatry, Iras Lakhna Medical College and Hospital, direct council member, as I have told his guest faculty in Amit University. And with these two, two firebrand mm -hmm. moderators, now I am going to introduce our esteemed chairpersons. Next, please. Pavan, uh, Dr. Charles Pinto, my dear, dear friend, who had kindly obliged me with one call that he will be chairing the session. Dr. Charles Pinto is a professor emeritus of psychiatry at the Department of Psychiatry, Topiwala National Medical College and BYL Nair Hospital. His director is such an academics and consulting psychiatrist at Holy Family Hospital. Dr. Pinto's main work has been geriatric psychiatry, especially dementia. In addition to being principal investigator in drug trials in India, he has conducted studies in childhood psychosis, irritable bowel syndrome, borderline personality disorder, and dementia, on which he has national and international publications. Welcome, Dr. Pinto. Thank you. So fun. And with us, we have Dr. Basudev Das Ranchi. He has given a very brief uh, biodata of himself and a very tiny photograph of himself, maybe decades back. And still, he appears as young and as he appears in the photograph. He is obviously a consultant in psychiatry with a genuine degree. He is professor of psychiatry in CIP Ranchi at present. And he has more than 50 publications. It is pretty but profound in time. Welcome, Dr. Basudev Das. Thank Welcome, you, sir. sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. With this, with a lot of hope, and Dr. Ajit Fide, he is his usual client, and he is going to speak on a topic in which he is going to tell, most likely, about all the psychotherapies. And I hand over the meeting to the chairpersons. Deliberations and proceedings and control are with you, Dr. Pinto and Dr. Das. So, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tofan, for inviting me on this particular uh, master class on psychotherapy on Thursday Musings. It is the 27th one. I have heard the 26th, and I've seen we have gone through all the psychotherapies and the various conditions that can be treated. I myself, of course, took up psychiatry thinking that I could read people's mind and fascinated by Freud, Adler, Jung, et cetera, et cetera. But as I slowly progressed, most probably I think so, I got lost in psychopharmacology, biology, and neurology, which I have participated. But I've come across people like Dr. Lulla, who was my teacher, and who was an Adlerian and existential therapist, mostly. And some people like Father Fuster at Davis College, Rogerian, Karkov's uh, modification. And uh, it's my good fortune to say something about what's going to happen today. Uh, and the speaker, speaker, of course, I think so Dr. Das will introduce him. I think uh, in psychotherapy, there are well-structured uh, psychotherapies like CBT and DBT. 
and then there are other unstructured ones freudian jung adler existential whatever mm -hmm. and behavior therapies and finally this word has come eclectic therapy pick and choose basically so dr ajit is talking on choosing a good school eclecticism in psychotherapy uh, there are people who have worked in this field like gordon paul the earliest person to work on eclectic therapy larry butler and there are mm. six six or seven types of them the most important one is the multimodal one by arvin lazarus which i was very really fascinated because he adds biology as a part of his psychotherapy and then there are other ones which gives us the three stage three state model then it gives us brief eclectic therapy it gives us how many sessions to be taken and which condition especially works for like ptsd and elective mutism especially but subsequent to that eclectic therapy has expanded and mm -hmm. includes possibly right from major depression anxiety relational problems and even school issues marital issues etc etc so i invite dr uh, ajit bide to pick and choose for us and tell us and guide us what is the eclectic therapy is about with examples or whatever it is and i ask dr das to introduce uh, dr ajit bide uh thank you sir first of all uh, my sincere thanks to professor tupanpati for giving me this opportunity uh, I, i i am indeed honored and privileged to be associated with uh, this uh, 27th thursday musings uh, where uh, professor ajit bide will speak and i have the honor to co-chair with uh, professor pinto uh, and my junior colleagues dr amrit and dr alim uh, uh, thank you all now uh, you all know uh, professor ajit bide uh, he needs no introduction uh, he is uh, the emeritus professor of psychiatry and uh, family medicine at st martha's hospital bengaluru and he is an alumnus of st john's medical college and of nimans bangalore he has served on the faculty of both the both, both these institutions he has uh, been an eminent psychiatrist at uh, indian psychiatric society karnataka state branch and most important he uh, is the past president of indian psychiatric society and his major major achievements are he presented two score lectures and workshop in uh, continuing medical education programs he has been the recipient of two oration awards from the indian psychiatric society in which he has served in many capacities and he conducted several seminars and workshops on life skills communication and stress prevention and management and he has published 17 papers in national and international journals he is the literary editor of indian journal of psychiatry professor ajit vidya sir now the stage is yours thank you vidya sir uh, yes uh good evening and uh first of all thank you for having me over here on thursday musings i had heard uh, at around the third thursday musings that i would be invited and i'm very glad to have received the invitation to be here to take part in this uh choosing a good school is the topic i've chosen please don't confuse this with anything in child psychiatry because we know that for several young parents especially this is a onerous task choosing the right school and today's talk has nothing to do with that i will come to why i particularly worded the title uh, this way in a while 
I am basically going to focus on eclecticism in therapy. And as Charles has had a sneak preview uh, earlier, I'm going to cover a lot more than that. And perhaps I'll be repeating some stuff that has already been covered, been covered in uh, earlier Thursday uh, musings. At the beginning, I'd like to dedicate my talk to my two teachers, both of whom are no more. Professor Ravi Kapoor was my absolutely the, the person from whom I learned psychiatry in my baby steps. And Professor Gauri Shankar Prabhu, my professor of clinical psychology who refined my uh, method of reading literature in the field of mental health in general and psychology in particular, both outstanding teachers to whom I owe a lot and who taught me a lot of, about therapy. Now, where did this title come from? When I was a postgraduate, we had the Bible of psychiatry was the American textbook, that is the comprehensive textbook of psychiatry, where Professor Jules Masserman, also late Professor Jules Masserman, I should say, who wrote a chapter on psychobiology. And uh, it is interesting because there was a reference by Charles earlier to the idea that it is biology. And I want to say that biology has become too restricted to what seems to be tangible, visible, uh, researchable more tangibly. So you have molecules, you have genes, uh, you have anatomic substrate, and only that is considered biology. But there's a whole science of ethology uh, allied to the study of animals, and ethology looks at animal behavior. And we, in a sense, as psychiatrists and psychologists, are human ethologists. We do study human behavior, and that is very much biology. So this idea that there could be a dichotomy between biology and psychology is somewhat artificial. But Jules Masserman was somebody I read about in Time magazine before I joined psychiatry. And then when the comprehensive textbook came along, into my hands, I mean, it had already been there, I read this chapter. And this is what Jules Masserman had to say over there. He said, I shudder to think of how very school bound we are becoming. As far as I, want, I would want schools to go, is to give a decent education to our kids. And oh yes, they should remain the collective noun for fish. In English, the collective noun for fishes is schools of fish. So there we are. He was gently mocking the idea that you should be an avowed member of one particular school of uh, psychology, psychiatry, or for that matter, psychotherapy. And this is where I get my title from. My brief for today, the exciting discoveries in the field of Again, I'm very careful. So-called biological psychiatry with due pronouns to my friends like uh, Dr. Bhaskar Mukherjee and uh, Malay Dave has wittingly and unwittingly reduced the appeal of psychotherapy. The burgeoning of newer concepts in and schools of psychotherapy is not new, but its continued growth can be mind boggling. When I was a postgraduate student, there were about 17 schools of psychotherapy already there. Today, claiming individuality and separateness from other therapies, there are no fewer than 200 schools of psychotherapy. So mind-boggling indeed. And this is mind-boggling not only to students of mental health, but even to seasoned practitioners. How do so many schools come about? Are they really different schools? We'll look at this somewhere later on when I have my personal take on uh, psychotherapy. Today, I attempt to find common ground among many and seemingly varied systems of therapy and advocate an accommodative eclectic approach in ministering to mind's disease. Ministering to mind's disease incidentally is a phrase from Shakespeare where when Lady Macbeth wrongly accused of suffering from OCD, but she, she has actually a delusion that there's blood on her hands related to a, a culpable act of hers, cannot get rid of the imaginary blood and uh, Macbeth asks the doctor in attendance, Canst thou minister to a mind diseased? So this is what we are doing most of the time, ministering to minds diseased. Most of us do already practice uh, eclectic approaches right now, but it is worth remembering the fractured and sectarian history of the practice of therapy in our profession. With due apologies to many friends who have a leaning towards psychodynamic and uh, psychoanalytic uh, forms of therapy, I would say that in the school of psychoanalysis more than anywhere else, a sort of cult was established by one person and then different cults grew out of that. Not at all unlike what happens in religious formations, that there is a minor disagreement and you uh, 
separate out, you bud out of that main, main branch onto something of your own. Now, while most of us, as I mentioned, are practicing eclectic uh, psychotherapy even now, it is worth remembering that we have a history where these things happen. And I'm going to allude to something in the course of my presentation, saying that again, there is a tendency to jump onto a certain bandwagon, which is not unlike the cults that were formed earlier. Let's uh, recall the famous words of the Spanish philosopher and writer, George Santayana, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And may this facet not attend on our lives in the field of mental health. I have a literary weakness, so I'll start with a poem to set the ball rolling. Pain gnaws into man, lacerating its claws. It's deposited like salt somewhere between the vertebrae. Shout something to the crowd. That's a lot of respect for cattle. Confess to a priest. Man doesn't believe in God. Confess to the wife. A pain inscrutable to her. Confess to the country. That's so immense it terrifies. And the psychiatrist walks in with a musketeer beard, warmly phlegmatic, faintly smelling of vodka. It's a Russian poem. I don't need to tell you that when vodka creeps in there. And though you tear your hair, he will listen for two hours to your woes and vexations and all for two bills. Afterwards, he goes on foot through grimy lanes. There is more to the poem, but that is not really relevant to us. So the psychiatrist comes in, very willing listener and very compassionate and likely to want to help and likely to succeed to help. That is the spirit of this poem. When we look at psychotherapy, we see a lot of dichotomies or uh, classificatory uh, posits that are sort of one versus the other. The classifications of psychiatry could be in the form of re-educated or reconstructed. In re-educative therapy, we are getting somebody to unlearn everything that he has learned because that is causing some degree of uh, maladaptation, sometimes gross maladaptation. Or sometimes the personality itself is so warped, it needs to be altogether reconstructed. This dichotomy was given to us by Louis Wahlberg in his classic on uh, uh, textbook on psychotherapy. And uh, when I was a postgraduate, this was a Bible to go to when you had any doubts about issues in psychotherapy. Then again, we have directive psychotherapy and non-directive psychotherapy. When I was a postgraduate student, we were told that in India, non-directive therapy is not going to mean much. People come to you for advice. They want you to tell them what to do. That was indeed the truth. Uh, it was uh, close to 40 years ago when, when I started my life in psychiatry. Then again, there is the notion that there is growth-oriented therapy and healing-oriented therapy. Now, are these two necessarily mutually exclusive? To my mind, they are not, but one can predominate over the other, depending on what the practitioner of the psychotherapy chooses as his modus operandi. Then again, you have short-term therapies and you have long-term therapy. Classically, psychoanalysis was something that went on not for just days and days, but weeks, months, years. And Freud's longest patient was with him for 27 plus years. And that is, that is quite a record. I don't know how much this actually reflects a sense of dependence. And that is a lurking danger in therapy that we render people quite, quite, quite dependent on us. This kind of dependence is warranted to a limited extent in uh, certain cases, but not for eternal life. But that does sometimes happen. And many of you who are in the field not necessarily devoted to psychotherapy, might have noticed this, that some people just cannot do without you. There was a lovely Hollywood movie also taken up by uh, Indian filmmakers called What About Bob? And this theme of dependence on a therapist was very well brought out, where the uh, person playing the uh, uh, patient is so enamored of the book he reads by a particular therapist, he enters into therapy with him and will not leave the therapist alone. He then pursues the therapist right to a point where he's on a vacation and having closely guarded uh, his uh, location at that time, having told everybody uh, that is close to him not to divulge where he is, 
our patient played by very brilliant, brilliantly by Bill Murray finds a place and goes there. So that is a story of dependence that comes sometimes from long-term therapy. And sometimes long-term therapy seems to have been enshrined by people who are in the practice of psychotherapy, particularly psychoanalysis. Then again, if you look at two processes, there is the field of the intrapsychic self and there is the interpersonal self. So psychotherapy could focus on how to improve within yourself, how to look at components of your uh, psychic makeup. Naturally, the word personality comes to mind. How to reshape your personality in certain respects, different dimensions of your personality, different aspects of your day-to-day -day, uh, uh, manifest mind, and then the interpersonal realm. Uh, the in, in the interpersonal realm, how to get on with people around you, people who are your immediate universe, that is your usually your intimate partner, then your uh, family uh, of origin and your family of procreation, and then the outer circle, the other relatives, friends, and the society at large. So psychotherapy has sometimes to enter that vast realm. Then again, we have this notion of group therapy and individual therapy. This is again another dichotomy, but uh, I find that these days in India, group therapy has somehow not picked up as much as it ought to have done. And uh, I'm very pleased that there are certain groups now formed. Uh, groups can be also be generated in the sense of self-help groups, started by individuals who have had a particular suffering. And the classical paradigm for the self-help group is, of course, the Alcoholics Anonymous. Many of us have a, a good working relationship with the Alcoholics Anonymous. And there is individual therapy as well. It is very interesting that a young colleague of mine who is specialized in the treatment of borderline personality disorder now has both individual and group therapy with uh, borderline personality disorder individuals, both genders. And she is very particular that those who are in the group will not be personally, uh, the, their individual therapy goes on with a different therapist and the group therapy goes on in, under her uh, tutelage and guidance. Uh, many groups insist that it has to be a participatory member who has to be the leader of the group. And that leadership can shift from person to person. So these are all aspects of the dichotomies within the field of psychotherapies, what we might call the classification of psychotherapies. Until the 1960s, it was largely the psychodynamic schools of psychotherapy hugely rooted in psychoanalysis that ruled the roost. These were uh, practiced in all the uh, major uh, academic centers and in several uh, uh, hospitals such as the Meninger Clinic. And we are talking mainly about the US where these phenomena were studied in detail or the Tavistock Clinic in uh, the UK and psychoanalytic and psychodynamic therapy ruled the roost. This pie chart that you see over here is from 2007. And we notice that there has been a sea change, something that was not known at that time. Cognitive therapy had now come up. Cognitive therapy had a uneasy relationship with behavior therapy for some time. And now, as we know, we hardly ever see cognitive therapy. We tend to marry the two and say cognitive behavior therapy. Uh, cognitive behavior therapy really is, uh, Charles mentioned in his uh, chairman's remarks that uh, Arnold Lazarus, Arnold Ra Lazarus is the man who's done a lot of work in the field of psychotherapy, a psychologist, of, uh, uh, sorry, a late professor of psychology, in fact, who first gave us the term behavior therapy. Uh, many students are not aware of that. They think, uh, I think is the one, yeah, I, I think no doubt is a uh, votary of uh, behavior therapy, but the word came to us from Arnold Lazarus, who had a lot to do with eclectic therapy, Though, ironically, he never ever used the word uh, eclectic. Then there was the third force in psychiatry. Behavior therapists were totally disenchanted with what the psychoanalysts were doing. They said, you deal with a lot of mumbo jumbo. We are going to be totally scientific about it. Observable behavior is what is most important. Narrated emotions are the only ones that will count, and we will look at the congruity of those emotions. But beyond that, the intrapsychic self is not what we need to deal with. We will deal with manifest behavior. So that was a behavioral school. 
Here we had the psychoanalytic school, which relied a lot, and it became more and more esoteric as Freud went along, and the budding of different schools of psychoanalysis took place from there. Uh, I, I'm even referring to analytical psychology and individual psychology as uh, under the broad rubric of uh, uh, psychoanalysis. The third force that came up said that there is too much of emphasis on science. The art of psychotherapy is being lost. And more importantly, the human touch, wittingly or unwittingly, is being sacrificed. And that gave rise to the humanistic school of psychotherapy. Among the most prominent votaries of that was uh, Carl Rogers, whom we will be seeing in some detail a little later. But there was also a humanistic school of psychology, uh, which had uh, several people who agreed with this notion that we need to be much more humane than we are managing with mere behavior therapy and uh, uh, psychoanalytic or psychodynamic uh, therapy. Then there were people dealing with family pathologies, finding pathology within the family that was contributing to the genesis or maintenance of mental illness. And these became the family therapists. And they used the systems theory to apply to the family as a system and the family systems form of therapy became quite popular. So if you look at a survey that was done in 2007 across, uh, I think 27, uh, uh, US states, this is what we find. Cognitive therapy has now gained the, uh, uh, of course, this data is also uh, 13 years old, uh, is almost half the people who are practicing therapy primarily practice cognitive therapy. Psychoanalytical, psychodynamic therapy was coming down. It was now just over a quarter of people. Uh, behavioral psychology and adherence to strictly behavioral uh, psychotherapies was about just short of 10% almost equal was the humanistic school of psychotherapy, and then the family and system therapy. They have not allowed in this particular analysis to look at the overlap that might have been occurring. And these, I think the, the, the question was, which form of therapy are you particularly committed to? And this is what we got. I don't know if there's been an update in the last 13 years on this kind of therapy. I, I'm sure there has been, but I haven't been able to come across that. So what is important across these therapies is a therapeutic relationship. Freud talked a lot about the therapeutic relationship. Alliance is a word that is commonly used. An alliance is a partnership necessarily between two allies who are working in a trusting relationship towards a mutually agreed upon goal. The two terms are used over here and psychology keeps splitting hairs and we have something called a working alliance and something called a therapeutic alliance and the most crucial single aspect of therapy is this alliance. Let's continue with the hair splitting and look at what they really mean. In a working alliance, you have three components. You have tasks, you have goals, and then you have a want. The tasks are well-defined. They are directed towards certain goals and tasks are actual actions that need to be taken in order to achieve those goals. And those tasks are generated in the course of a conversation between therapist and the person seeking the therapy. The goals are primarily defined by what the person who's seeking help has come with and what he wants to achieve in life or what he wants to negate in his uh, mental life. In order to do this, there has to be a bond and these three constitute then the working alliance. This bond really, and this is my own extrapolation, is what is called the therapeutic alliance. This bond, borrowing from uh, words used mainly by the humanistic school. There has to be a mutual respect between the two people. There has to be a positive regard, particularly from the therapist to the person seeking, the, to the help seeker. And this entails a certain degree of affectional transference of one's psychic energies to that person. And that phenomenon, which we know is called transference. Transference has many variants. Transference is almost always accompanied by varying degrees of counter-transference. Transference is the feeling of the uh, uh, help seeker towards the therapist. Counter-transference is what the uh, therapist feels towards the uh, client. In psychoanalysis, great emphasis was placed on transference and they carried it to a bit of an e extreme where they believe that without transference, uh, therapy cannot progress. I think that is an overstatement if there ever there is one. 
There are various other mechanisms that underlie transference, which Freud himself began to write on. And much more work was done on transference by his very brilliant daughter, uh, whose birthday we recently observed. Anna Freud uh, looked at transference and she was the one who really gave the idea that transference is going back to your unconscious, which is something generated by your feelings for other authority figures in your life. And the therapist becomes now a replacement for that authority figure. Now, when we look at psychotherapy, let's look at certain variables that determine how therapy would progress. Obviously, the person who is going to be a psychotherapist needs mastery of technical skills. And this takes place usually in a good training center over a period of time. But uh, from personal observation, I will say this much, that to train as a therapist, my getting through my MD was just a minuscule of what I have been able to do afterwards. The next 10 years after your qualification with a postgraduate degree are what really, to my mind, is the period when you master technical skills about how to proceed in therapy. Of course, essential to being a good therapist is the empathetic attitude. And certain people who have a fantastic theoretical knowledge of what psychotherapy is all about, and I had a very remarkable teacher who was a walking encyclopedia of psychiatry, but somehow I got the feeling that the empathetic attitude, empathic attitude or empathetic attitude was not quite there when I look back. Very important to therapist variables are the therapist's communication skills. It bears repetition though it is common knowledge, listening, a skill not adequately practiced by very many people who've been in the field for a very long time too. Listening should be accompanied not by pretense hearing, but by actual pondering over what is registering as a means of that listening. Listening also can happen in terms of observation of nonverbal cues that the uh, uh, help seeker is putting before us, that the patient is uh, feeding to us wittingly and unwittingly. Also, emphasized by certain schools of psychotherapy, there is a feedback that, so this is what you mean to say, especially when the output from the patient is very wordy, you want to feed it back to him. Say, is that exactly what you mean? So you are feeling jealous of your brother-in-law for X, Y, Z reasons. And this is the, the, this is the antecedent incidence that is giving rise to this. All right. And get the feedback to ensure that you have understood everything clearly. Then interpreting, interpreting can be direct or it very often entails reading between the lines. And that is important. Also, in the course of the person revealing his inner self, he is in a sense stripping his mind before you. The therapist has to have an adequate knack of diplomacy. He should not react. Somebody reveals that, I have seen this happening. Somebody reveals that they were contemplating a murder of a relative. Somebody reveals that they have homosexual leanings towards somebody though they've been reading a heterosexual life. These are red flags that you should be aware of and handle with care. Very often diplomacy is confused with uh, feel good lying. So calling a, an ugly woman beautiful is not what diplomacy is all about. Diplomacy is much more than that. An effort not to, especially at the first go, hurt the other individual who is seeking your help. So in the uh, therapeutic variable of communication skills, verbal and non-verbal -communica non communications must be uh, something which the therapist is quite alert to. Also, there should be a keen awareness of the boundary limits that are there. What degree of intimacy can therapist and uh, client or patient have? Where, does it, where to draw the line? How much is permissible? How much is not permissible? That, that is a, a area where a slippery slope might indeed attend and a good therapist would be able to not only set those limits, but impose them. Also, therapist variables include discipline. This is an area which is common to uh, punctuality, grooming, politeness. This is an area which is common to uh, the uh, client variables too. Also, there has been some suggestion that people who have a certain charisma about them make much better therapists than people who are devoid of charisma. And charisma is not just popularity. Charisma is not good looks. 
the charisma is a personal uh, quality that transcends any of these, though it may involve all these, and goes on to holding on to the therapist as somebody you really care for. Then there are patient variables. I remember a very charming poem written by Dr. Savita Malhotra many years ago. Dr. Savita Malhotra was very enamored of uh, training in psychotherapy and uh, she wrote a beautiful poem based on what her boss had told her, what, who's the kind of ideal person for psychotherapy. And she says, if everybody had those qualities, I doubt he would want to come for therapy. So one important quality among patient variables is charm. We tend to find charming people as very good patients for psychotherapy. Also, people who are pliable, people whose method of thinking we can somewhat uh, mold, people who are receptive to other ideas. And you have in the course of psychotherapy, a chance of encountering people who are totally close to certain notions. Those notions may be about the intrapsychic processes. Those notions may be about their uh, relationship issues. Those notions may be about their uh, uh, ability to cope with stress, even a hypothetical one. And if they're receptive to these ideas, then it usually makes a good patient for uh, psychotherapy. Again, what we mentioned earlier, discipline in the form of punctuality, decent grooming and politeness do count a lot. Also patients who are articulate usually make good subjects for uh, psychotherapy. Patients whose linguistic limitations are very severe. They're, they're not able to put their ideas across uh, cogently or coherently become uh, people who are difficult to engage in uh, psychotherapy. Mind you, a lot of the time people have a certain degree of awareness that their linguistic abilities are limited. And we have the phenomenon of alexithymia where people are not just not able to communicate adequately in words what they feel, what they uh, want to communicate, what they need to communicate in the course of the progress in psychotherapy. There is also the notion of a difficult patient. Patients who very commonly or repeatedly miss appointments, miss making payments for consultations, avoid coming at the exactly the uh, due time, do not do the tasks assigned to them, or very simplistically, the difficult patients. But there are patients who are determined to, uh, it's a sort of reflection of their daily life, determined to pull the therapist down, determined to find fault with the therapist, determined not to make progress, though ostensibly they have come to you to make progress. And these difficult patients can be quite a challenge. And that is a final variable among the uh, patient variables. Other common factors that are common across the uh, spectrum of different types of therapy, hope, that is positive expectations. Therapists of all kinds provide hope or a sort of optimistic attitude that things will begin to improve. And even when negativity is faced, there has to be the tiny stream of hope running if psychotherapy is to succeed. That stream might be blocked for some time, but it cannot be blocked for long. Then only psychotherapy can progress. Attention, this is something called the Hawthorne effect. Very simply, the Hawthorne effect is something that alters your manifest behavior when you know you are being observed. And this is very much relevant to the field of psychotherapy because the therapist is observing the client, the client is simultaneously observing the therapist and attention must be paid to that. Dr. Charles also referred to the three-stage sequential model of uh, common factors across therapies, beginning with the support factor stage, strong therapist-client relationship, that they, are, they have that positive regard and mutual respect. Second is a stage of learning factors, which includes such aspects as changing expectations of oneself, changes in the thought processes, which might be slightly or grossly uh, pathological. Corrective, <coughs> sorry, corrective emotional <coughs> experiences, and indeed, correcting the entire emotional repertoire to situations in one's life. <coughs> the third stage is what has been called the action factors, that is taking risks, facing fears, practicing and mastering new behaviors, 
and almost always this is negating uh, unhealthy behaviors and bringing in mastering uh, healthy behaviors. The noteworthy schools of psychotherapy, which I will dwell on sh uh, shortly, psychoanalysis or psychodynamic therapy. This is the legacy of Cy Sigmund Freud and his followers. Humanistic or client-centered therapy, typified by the work of Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow. Behavior therapy, which is based basically on conditioning. Skinner and Pavlo are mentioned over here. Cognitive therapy, uh, changing one's style of thinking, one's content of thinking, and we give credit to Aaron Beck and uh, Albert Ellis, reducing errors in these processes, which will hopefully lead to reducing distress. Let's look at the analysts. You see a very, very stern Papa Freud over there. And uh, I think it is befitting that we have him depicted here in that same uh, sternness because he was a taskmaster. Sigmund Freud believed sincerely in all that he said, and he brooked no opposition unless it was substantiated adequately. Right under him, you see Carl Jung. Freud was very puzzled and to some extent troubled by the fact that he was a Jew. And most of the people who gravitated to taking up uh, his form of treatment of mental maladies were from his religion. So he was very thrilled when a bright young doctor by the name of Carl Jung, a Swiss Christian, decided to adopt Freud as his uh, guru in a sense. We'll have something to say about Guru and Chela shortly, but Carl Jung took up the cause of psychoanalysis. Eventually he broke away because the methods of Freud which necessitated total devotion and acceptance. And if you had to question him, you had to do it in a very, very meticulous, around about way with skills for conviction, uh, convincing uh, the uh, papa about why you deferred from him. Something which Freud's own daughter, the very uh, charismatic and uh, uh, charming Anna Freud did manage. And Anna Freud, it is worth recording, continued to have a very good uh, professional relationship with most of the people who had broken away from Freud, including this other gentleman we see in the other corner. This is uh, Alfred Adler. Alfred Adler was a practicing doctor who had been befuddled by certain odd behaviors of people, and he decided to study these behaviors. As he was studying these behaviors, he came across the work of Sigmund Freud, and they got in touch. And Adler himself, a Jew again, uh, was taken up by Freud's notions about how the personality develops, taken up by the idea that uh, uh, there were different responses in the intrapsychic self to different situations. And Adler started his own studies. But one thing, Adler, though he was of a analytical bent of mind, hated being called Freud's uh, uh, Anuyayi, his follower, and he always insisted that his was an independent school on its own. Somewhat more loyal, let's say, to Freud was this gentleman over here, Eric Erickson. Eric Erickson was a Swiss uh, uh, psychoanalyst who gained a lot from interacting with Anna Freud and subsequently with uh, Sigmund Freud himself. And uh, he was quite flummoxed by Freud's other preoccupation. As we know, Freud was massively preoccupied with the psychosexual self and the psychosexual stages of development. And Erickson didn't quite uh, fall in line with that. So he developed other schema for understanding the stages of development, which I was very, very influenced by. Eric Erickson was invited by John Kennedy, uh, the, 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 like the uh, the uh, Ratnas of uh, Akbar's court, John Kennedy wanted to give great impetus to artists and intellectuals. And uh, I read this uh, speech which Eric Erickson gave at the White House when he was invited by John Kennedy called the Eight Ages of Man. And I think that's some seven ages of man, which I think we should go through as a good exercise in observing things and not merely going by mumbo jumbo that I feel a lot of uh, Freudian theory really was. For example, the anal stage, the uh, Electra complex, the Oedipus complex, 
the uh, the forces of eros and thanatos all, all, all these are very fancy and appealing but not quite science but we'll come to that a little later and then we have over here somebody who could be a fairy godmother or the ugliest witch with curses on her lips all the time this is melanie klein melanie klein was actually a school teacher very observant about children's behavior very keen to change children's behavior of course for the better and she went about it in she had both these personas that of a, a very benign motherly figure willing to give in and also a harsh disciplinarian so that was melanie klein these are some of the typical analysts but before we are accused of falling prey only to western notions let's look at some analysts of indian origin uh, we have over here girindra shekhar bose the great doctor who observed human behavior among different classes of society freud for all his concern about humanity hardly ever dealt with the lower segments of society and girindra shekhar bose actually had a small little uh, room where anybody was welcome provided they booked their time and came and his fees were highly variable being close to zero at times because he wanted to encourage people he also was very enamored of uh, freud and his ideas particularly the, the notion of the unconscious but he did away with the couch he said a table and chair is good enough for people to sit down and have a chat uh, two chairs and across a table that uh, we know that even today the table has also been done away with with more psychodynamic uh, setups but that that's where we go then we have the great sudhir kakkar we had him come and address our uh, conference a couple of years ago sudhir kakkar was an engineer who was very taken up with the uh, psychological mechanisms and psychological operations and psychological maladies he didn't call them illnesses he called them maladies and he studied these in great detail principally on account of the fact that his aunt his mother's sister was a great devotee of psychoanalysis and that is what caused sudhir kakkar to gravitate towards uh, psychoanalysis to begin with afterwards he did great work on his own and he's a very very popular author and very readable author and very simplifies the notions of psychoanalysis in an indian context quite uh, well we also have i had to include indian origin i was corrected by a friend uh, not to say indian analyst this is the great uh, salman akhtar who has also been uh, a faculty at many of our uh, gatherings and salman akhtar is a practicing psychoanalyst uh, an alumnus of the pgi chandigarh and i understand it's again because of professor savita malhotra that his interaction with indian psychiatrists great 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 impetus almost every year in some part of the country you have salman coming across and talking to us about good things in the mind bad things in the mind unconscious motivation he's written a wonderful book that i recently read that is on guilt how to understand guilt and how to deal with guilt in a clinical context so these are the uh, uh, analysts of indian origin then we have the behaviorists much indebted to the recognition of reflex behavior in animals ivan pavlov set out to be a priest was totally disillusioned with religion gave it up almost overnight went into medical school joined medical school and excelled over there in physiology and then decided that he is going to observe how certain behaviors are automatic and he was the one who gave us uh, an insight into reflex behavior we won't go into the pavlov and his experiments with dogs but suffice it to say that pavlov's work influenced a large number of people almost simultaneously with pavlov's work was a person called thorndike who was a professor of psychology in uh, in american university stanley hall was very impressed with the consider the father of american psychology was very impressed with pavlov's work but these are the people who really concentrated on behaviorism that is the observable behavior being given the great impetus the south african physician joseph wolpe uh, were very uh, uh, important among among them then uh, watson and b f skinner who also contributed to understanding reflex mechanisms and how behavior is reinforced by certain uh, reflexes which to begin with are unconscious but they get linked up to stimuli and thereby hangs a tail then we have the humanists carl rogers 
and Abraham Maslow. Both had a fantastic relationship between themselves, as you would expect given their philosophical leanings, that they wanted humaneness, they wanted greater uh, cohesiveness and a non-hostile atmosphere in which mental health could be properly practiced. Carl Rogers' book on being a person was a phenomenal bestseller and treasured by universities for well over uh, four decades. Even today, it's a reasonably popular book, but not the bestseller that it used to be. Maslow, on the other hand, was the first person to turn his attention away from the pathological and to look at healthy personalities and see what they were all about. And then when we say that psychotherapy can be a healing process or it can be a growth process, I think this is the man who should be given the credit for that because he said there is something called a hierarchy of needs. Until you have a full stomach, there is no point in uh, uh, talking about spirituality, talking about prayer, talking about higher needs. And the final highest need of all, uh, uh, transgressing the basic needs, going through the meta needs, and then the need for self-actualization is the highest of all needs, which is of course of a spiritual nature. Then we have the cognitive and realistic schools. A person I was very, very taken up a few years after my qualifying in psychiatry is uh, William Glasser, who is nowadays hardly mentioned in any literature. William Glasser founded what is called the realist, uh, realistic school of uh, psychotherapy. Uh, his ideas are somewhat akin to the other two gentlemen whom you've obviously, most of you would be quite aware of. That is Aaron Beck and Albert Ellis. Uh, Aaron Beck, of course, we credit with having brought to us cognitive therapy, uh, which is so immensely popular, though I'm not sure necessarily properly practiced or understood. And Albert Ellis, who had actually had practically the same ideas much earlier, gave us what he initially called rational therapy, then changed it to rational emotive therapy. And both of them, Beck as well as Ellis, had their schools of thought married with behavior therapy and they became cognitive behavior therapy and rational emotive behavior therapy. Other psychotherapies are there by the plenty. I'm just quickly going to run through them. Interpersonal therapy, the uh, outcome of the work of Harry Stack Sullivan, who believed that interpersonal processes determine your psychological well-being to a great extent. He gave us the concept of the significant other. Social rhythm therapy, which is really about disciplining yourself and seeing that your biological rhythms are disciplined, and the two are very often combined together. Mindfulness-based therapy, which is akin to mindfulness meditation, though not entirely synonymous with it. Mentalization-based therapy, which is concerned with mental processes that underlie pathological behavior, particularly with regard to uh, emotional instability. Family therapy, which looks at family mainly as a systems unit and needs correction within it. Dialectic behavior therapy, acknowledgedly an offshoot of behavior therapy, incorporating a lot of humanistic principles, though Marsha Lenehan, who is the advocate of this therapy, personally, I have great quarrels with dialectic behavior therapy because I find that it incorporates almost anything that comes along from playing the sitar to yoga to meditation. Everything is accommodated in dialectic behavior therapy. But uh, I, I must say that I'm impressed with what Ma Marsha Lenehan done because very, for a very long time, we were thinking of borderline personalities as people without hope. Now, dialectic behavior therapy has also been applied to a variety of other therapies. Just all therapy, not to be confused with just all psychology entirely, because just all therapy was the outcome again of humanistic uh, school. And it was started by Fritz S. Pearls, who wanted a friendliness to pervade therapies altogether. Transactional analysis, really a modification of psychoanalysis, which uh, uh, TA people will never, never admit, but they too believe in the eat ego and superego and malfunctions between them. And of course, then going on to paradigms of I'm okay, you're okay, and variations on that theme. Existential therapy and logotherapy. Uh, Victor Frankl on the one hand, Rollo May on the other, were advocates of this form of therapy. Hypnotherapy, we won't uh, dwell on that. Acceptance and commitment therapy, a fascinating title. And I think acceptance and commitment should really be the accompaniments of various forms of therapy, but it has uh, come to stay as a separate form of therapy. More about that a little later. Art therapy using different modalities of art, from fine arts to performing arts, but not performing arts, which are really covered by 
movement and exercise based therapy physical practices based therapy but using art to express oneself and in a sense play therapy might be considered a variation of art therapy which is usually used with uh, uh, middle school and lower age children morita therapy which believed a lot in isolation and introspection which was born in japan something which is i am very fond of bibliotherapy the use of literature to get people to understand mind and mental processes much better and to get into corrective action too the narrative based therapy i noticed that shaker had spoken to uh, spoken at thursday musings just last time last week i think on uh, using narrative form of therapy in the context of child sexual abuse and the list goes on please forgive me if your favorite therapy has not been mentioned over here but i've tried to cover as many as i have been uh, i have been aware of which brings us to eclecticism eclecticism is a conceptual approach that does not hold on rigidly to a single paradigm or to a single set of assumptions but instead draws on multiple theories styles ideas to gain complementary insights into a subject and applies different theories in particular cases as its name indicates eclectic therapy is a therapeutic approach that incorporates a variety of therapeutic principles so you can have free association for some time but not all the time you may have didactic uh, tasks laid out where you have to fill in a pro forma uh, at another time so where a variety of th therapeutic principles and philosophies in order to create the ideal treatment program to meet the specific needs of a particular patient or client now eclectic therapy has gone by a number of names multimodal therapy as uh, dr charles mentioned in, in his chairman's remarks at the very start that is uh, arnold lazarus integrative psychotherapy the american psychiatric association and the american psychological association have made a sharp distinction between integrative and eclectic therapy i personally find there's no room for that that, that kind of a hair splitting but more about that if we have time in the discussion and then everybody wants to have credit for coining a new name so multi theoretical therapy all of these to my mind are really synonyms for eclectic therapy we cannot leave the theme of cults of gurus and chelas of thinking of the psychotherapist as a seer or, or prophet when we are dealing with eclectic therapy because we said we must not repeat history and this is what happened freud and his followers jung and his followers adler and his followers Carl Rogers and his followers would not accept any other modality of therapy, though as they say, the humanists were more accommodative than most of the others. Of course, the great Hans Eysenck, who could not see beyond anything except behavior therapy as scientifically valid. So you have a guru and a chela. A chela can become a guru only after years of rigorous indoctrination. didactic and practical learning under the guru then the chela has his apprenticeship it is only then that he is ready to be turned on his head and he becomes a guru as beautifully brought out in this uh, cartoon by dr avinash so another time another place this is what happened to most of the schools of psychoanalysis that jules masserman was talking about right in the beginning i i'm shut i shut it to think of how schooled we are becoming how adherent we are becoming how loyalists we are becoming to particular schools we have gautama buddha we have prophet mohammed we have jesus christ and we have shankaracharya seers prophets that's what these people were they gave religious doctrines they gave religious uh, education basically emphasizing morality moral rectitude and uh, Uh, avoidance of deliberate evil that 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 is a common tenet to all these what happened to psychotherapy especially after freud landed in america was something like he became like the lord over here uh, lord jesus christ giving a sermon on the mount or buddha giving uh, uh, his bhikkhus their sermon mohammed talking to his disciples shankara talking to his disciples on the banks of the narmada these are exactly the kind of paradigms that began to transfer so they became cults cults are religious or quasi religious groups that have a dedication to beliefs with one or a few core ones core beliefs they are often unusual quaint and difficult to prove and like the existence of god difficult to prove even worse difficult to disprove they are well organized hierarchical and authoritarian 
We have in Hinduism this notion of mats, and in Karnataka we call them mathas. And you have the head of a matha who should never be questioned. Those are called the matharipatis. Cults tend to be highly cohesive, often are hostile to non-members, and the worst fate awaits those who begin to question these core beliefs or authority. We have seen this happening over and over in various uh, religious fora. Unfortunately, the same thing has happened in schools of psychotherapy. Luciano Labate, uh, Italian trained American psychologist, wrote wonderfully about this cults and psychotherapy, identified three magical cults, I haven't the, uh, the details over here, and five corresponding dogmas in clinical psychology and psychotherapy that are now accepted on faith. You jolly well believe in it. If you don't, then you're out. Determine most of the current practices. This, this, this statement was made by uh, Labate in his uh, book, I think in uh, 2007, 2004, sorry. Apparently, both critically and normatively accepted cults are believed and considered as the main, if not the sole ways to improve maladjustment or even deal with psychopathology. That is the most unfortunate thing that, that, that happened. The influence of these cults, Labate goes on, is by now so pervasively ingrained in our clinical evaluative, preventive and therapeutic practices that to propose otherwise is akin to being viewed as a traitor, risking alienation from the mainstream establishment of clinical psychology or psychotherapy. The dissemination and implementation of evidence-based psychological treatments has contributed, according to other authors, uh, but quoted by Labate, substantially to the legitimacy of these cults. So evidence base has been used and abused much more than we really, really realize. Just to lighten the moment, here is a, a doggy analyst who says, my therapy is quite simple. I wipe my tail, lick your face until you feel good about yourself again. Does remind you a little bit of humanistic school? I wouldn't blame you. There has also been a recurrent distinction between counselor and psychotherapist. At the end of almost 40 years of being in the field, I find that this distinction is not really rigid. Counselor somehow is a uh, slightly infradic. Psychotherapist is uh, not infradic, is, is the superior being, but we leave it at that. So this is the distinction I found. Short-term solutions, long-term solutions, action and behavior based, uh, whereas this is feeling and experience based. This is a secondary process, primary process. I, I don't know, I, I really believe that we are unnecessarily creating a dichotomy. Gains from differing schools and some negatives also we'd like to mention. My own practice has taught me a number of things to appreciate in psychoanalysis and psychodynamic therapies. Most importantly, defense mechanisms, recognizing them, healthy, unhealthy, and neutral defense mechanisms. The very notion of the unconscious and the subconscious mind is something which I treasure. Transference and variations on transference, including counter-transference and positive and negative transference. Developmental stages, and I'd say not the Freudian developmental stage, including the oral, anal, and so forth, but the Ericksonian stages. Importance of early experience, duly emphasized by uh, uh, Freud to begin with and many others. Introversion, extroversion, notions given to us mainly by Carl Jung, substantially expanded on by the behaviorist, ironically, uh, Hans Eysenck many years later. Complexes, the superiority complex, which always has an origin in an inferiority complex, something which we do encounter in a clinical situation uh, given to us by Alfred Adler. And also from Adler, the tendency in a large sip ship or your position in the birth order to determine certain attributes of your personality. I find this quite useful. But there are negatives. That's why the thumbs down over there. Psychodynamic school is actually the most doctrinaire of all. Hum kare so kaida, hum kahe so kaida. Fanciful and speculative notions masquerading as established science. I already mentioned that there was a search on, would you believe it, for the anatomical basis of the Oedipus complex. Now, nothing can be more pseudoscience than that. Psychopathology derived from single case studies. Freud's entire thesis on paranoia is based on his reading of a book review and then the book of an autobiography by Judge Schrieber. And I think to extrapolate from one study, intense though that study might be, is not quite on. When you read Freud, it is very, very interesting literature. But then literary merit drowns the scientific rigor. G.K. Chesterton, the English wit and writer and uh, avowed uh, adherence of Catholicism 
said, had said this, reflecting Catholic uh, sentiment, psychoanalysis is confession without absolution. In the Catholic Church, one way of getting rid of the miseries of your wrongdoings is to go for confession. And the priest gives you a method of overcoming your guilt by uh, offering you absolution through certain practices or prayers. And that is called absolution. G.K. Chesterton, who had a personal acquaintance with Freud, after studying whatever was available to him at that time about psychoanalysis, had this to say. Behavioral schools, basically the reward within inverted commas punishment, because it doesn't always have to be punishment. So some systems of aversive conditioning do use punishment. Basically reinforcing healthy behavior. Phasic response graph, systematic desensitization. We mentioned Wolpe. Wolpe was really the father of this method of uh, slowly getting used to something of which one is afraid or one is averse to over a period of time from an image to an, from an idea to an image to an actual object. That is how you get over it. And I find this quite useful. Classical and operant conditioning, of course, operates quite a lot in our daily lives and with our, with our patients. The great thing about behavior therapy is not to labor too much over cause, but to energetically pursue symptom removal or at least symptom reduction. Cognitive and realistic schools, recognition and correction of faulty cognitions. Here, are, here is an arbitrary list of uh, cognitions, arbitrary inference and selective abstraction, overgeneralization, personification, magnification and minimization, labeling and mislabeling, and dichotomous thinking. These are classical uh, faulty cognitions that need correction in the course of cognitive therapy. My uh, enchantment with William Glasser and his work with reality therapy, where they focus on action, behavior, control, and focus on the present. That, that, that was the great lesson of uh, William Glasser for me, that Focusing on the present has become such a preoccupation with many of the later schools of psychotherapy. It, 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 it gave me great uh, uh, impetus to pursue this because not to be stuck with the past, but there is a caveat to that, which I'll come to later when I speak about my personal takes. And then you have a series of uh, black and white thinking uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, mental setups. This is the uh, rational emotive therapy that Albert, Alice, Albert Ellis uh, advocated. Here, here are the 11 irrational beliefs challenged by REBT. Basically, to look at grays and not think only in black and white. From the humanistic school, unconditional positive regard. And this school best avoids making any judgmental uh, statements or uh, 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 having judgmental attitudes. Empathy is maximally emphasized in the humanistic school. They also talk about genuineness. And the incongruence between one's self-concept, one's actual experience creates problems and mental distress and even mental illness. Focus on the present and future, not on the past as uh, Rogers repeatedly emphasized. And from Maslow, the fulfillment of lower needs is necessary to, for anybody to aspire to and rise to higher needs. This is what uh, Rogers said about 40 years after he had been in uh, the process of teaching therapy. In my early professional counseling, actually, in my early professional years, I was asking the question, how can I treat or cure or change this person? Now I would phrase the question in a different way. That is, how can I provide a relationship which this person may use for his own personal growth? And that relationship is with the therapist, mind you. So which type of psychotherapy is best? Saul Rossin White, I hope I got the spelling right. I'm not very good at German. Uh, I'm not good at German at all, to confession. Uh, basically states that more than 500 different kinds of psychotherapies are all equally effective. Reminds you of a statement from Lewis Carroll, which says, everybody has one and all must have prizes. I don't subscribe to such a, to, I'm going to use a word which is very harsh. It's a very pedestrian notion that everything works. I use the same term also to describe the notion at a, in a different field that is uh, psychopharmacology, where all the antidepressants are equally effective. Not quite, but that's a different uh, ball game altogether. So I go to my favorite Sanskrit, and I quote a Suhashit over here from the Bharat Rari, which says, Dadi Maduram Madhu Maduram, Raksha Madhura Sudhapi Maduraiva, Tasya Tadevahi Maduram, Yasya Mano, Yatra Saunadnam. Yogurt is sweet, so are honey, grapes, and nectar. But a thing is sweet only where one's mind is attached to it. As a more recent uh, 
a Spanish uh, poet has said, fair is not fair, but that which pleases. In, in fact, this is what applies to all our lives. We, we choose our favorite food. We choose our favorite uh, uh, mode of operation. We choose our favorite therapy. I'll go quickly through two quick case vignettes. Uh, case vignette one, 26 year old Vasu. These are both cases uh, recently in uh, touch with me. A graphic designer, artist, an artist sought treatment for his sleep disturbance since about eight months. He had recently been divorced and was unhappy about, not about the divorce itself as much as his feelings of guilt over not having been a to totally transparent with his wife of a year, a year and a half, about his smoking, drinking, and need to hang out with the boys. He now lived with his parents and detested their constant questioning about his well being, his neglect of physical exercise, which he was quite devoted to earlier, his coming home late on many occasions. This led to frequent arguments and unsavory scenes and fights between the two sets, parents and the patient. On two occasions, he had come close to deciding to end his life, but the thought of his parents' plight and the shame they would have to face kept him from attempting suicide. Very recently, he had increased his intake of liquor and was increasingly drinking alone, something which is usually a bad sign for anybody on alcohol. Very quickly, the eclectic inputs that I can think of were the psychodynamic plane, his defenses of displacement and acting out. He needs behavioral control, behavior therapy particularly to understand the pathological drinking patterns that could lead on to uh, disasters in an already disturbed mind. I could detect no faulty cognitions in this particular case, but then from the humanistic perspective, his care for his parents' plight in the context of his suicidal plans was a very uh, good uh, positive thing that he had about him, which needed much reinforcement and strengthening. My second case is a 47 year old widow, Gina, the mother of two adult children, both living abroad, who kept breeding, brooding over the demise of her 53 year old husband, owing to a rapidly progressing cancer that caused him to become progressively weak and then became emaciated. He was gone within four months of his diagnosis, and neither child could be here with her owing to the pandemic. She would constantly be riddled with feelings of guilt about not having done enough for her spouse, but could not state where she might have better helped him. When Gina's son came down for a few months after her husband's death, he had to practically force her to come for psychiatric help. She was tearful, morose. She was bordering on the mute. It was difficult to get a word out of her and disheveled and poorly kept, which was not her normal personality. Here, the eclectic inputs are the psychodynamic, again, unhealthy defenses. She is in denial and distortion of her abilities to deal with the situation. Cognitive, dis cognitive distortions are here in the form of personalization, labeling and overreaching. And in terms of reality therapy, a practical sense of needing to move on. If I might get personal, the personal take of an eclectic therapist, bandwagons change over time. In my postgraduate days, it was community psychiatry. Today, I hear CPT being bandied about left, right, and center. What kind of therapy would you engage in? CBT is the glib answer. Today, when I hear CBT being pushed like a panacea, like a cure-all for everything, I quite often cringe. A quest that many troubled patients come with is to have it acknowledged that life has not been quite fair to them. This need is not quite often even recognized. Now, I mentioned that preoccupation with the present, don't go to the past. The be here and now approach, emphasizing the present and neglecting or even debunking the past is not always correct. A term that I've grown to like is toxic nostalgia. I got this from an autobiography of a psychiatrist by David Wiscott. The number of patients who do not want prescriptions, but they want therapy is geometrically increasing since the turn of the last century is my personal observation. And let's face it, Training in psychotherapy is quite inadequate in very many centers. The personal take of, an, uh, of this therapist is that therapists are human, but our clientele expects perfection of us. Look at the Rubik's Cube that is confused in three people over here. The doctor who comes out is expected to be perfectly formed. And this is not a hyperbolic need. This is a very natural need that is the kind of attitude that many patients are bound to have. And we must respect that even when we acknowledge our imperfections. Professional burnout, compassion fatigue are realities that we have to live with and do our best to prevent it, recognize it, and correct it. 
Doctors are the most overworked professionals in our country. I've said this a number of times, especially when I held a uh, respectable office, and nobody is doing anything about it. I mean, nobody in people in powers that be. I believe every doctor, especially the young doctors, I'm referring especially to young qualified doctors and senior postgraduate students, need at least 24 hours off on a week to keep their mental apparatus in fit state. Confession, I don't have any statistics to prove any of this, so these are my contentions. How do these various schools evolve? A young Western trained therapist, after successfully practicing, begins to find limitations of his original school. He finds loopholes in it, gains new insights in incorporating these new insights and removing the loopholes. He integrates the whole into a new therapy and a new brand is born. This is quite the story of Dr. Aaron Beck, who was initially very enamored of psychoanalysis, practiced it in seven years. He started seeing things going wrong in uh, psychoanalysis, that it was too full of fancy and he evolved cognitive therapy. Witness the marked overlap between the neurotic, neurotic and pathological defenses of psychoanalysis and the faulty cognitions of cognitive therapy. Is it all old wine in new bottles? No other field of work or study lends itself to drawl, mocking, and sometimes what might seem offensive humor as much as psychiatry in general and psychotherapy in particular. But I believe we are seasoned and we learn to laugh at our own profession quite well. And that does us some good when we don't react in a hypersensitive fashion as some of us do. The best byproduct of the practice of therapy is the gaining of personal insights and then of personal growth. I can vouch for this for myself. Having checked with colleagues in my younger days, there is a high that ensues from a good session of therapy. And my observation is that if the practice of therapy does not sometimes give you the merry fatigue of a satisfying long distance run, there's something going wrong somewhere. And finally, the best therapists are those who have at least one passion beyond the practice of psychiatry. It could be anything. It could be music. It could be sport. It could be writing. But there has to be that one passion. It could be reading, but genre reading, not reading anything that comes your way. So today we have reviewed the nature of psychotherapy, looked at some of the well-known schools and found the usefulness of some of the concepts and practices of each, cautioned against cultism that creeps into the practice of therapy, no longer attendant, at least in our country. Finally, thank you for having indulged me in almost uh, my four, uh, my almost four decade journey and allowed me to share my observations and insights. For this, thank you. Thank you too to my dear friends, Dr. Amrit, Dr. Tofan, Dr. Aleem, the IPS Odisha branch under whose aegis we meet for these Thursday musings, to my very uh, indulgent chairpersons, Dr. Charles Pinto and Dr. Vasudev Das, and to all of you. Thank you very much. And my email address is there. I love to correspond. Thanks very much. Thank you, sir. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ajit Bide, for your poetic and charismatic narrative of all the psychotherapies and what is eclecticism and eclectic therapy to end with. And uh, of course, you are the James Bond of the IPS. You have a personality of that kind. I can't give you whether you're 007 or 0100, whatever it is. But I think it's a very exhaustive and very informative presentation made by you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bide. Ajit. Thanks, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Sir, I was going to say, Suhana, Safar, or Mausam Hasi. Sir, I was going to say, this 40 years of experience that was poured on us, sir. Thank you so much for it. Uh, Tofan, sir, can we take a few questions now? Yes, yes, please take the question. Amrit, would you like to start? Yeah. First of all, I would like to congratulate, sir. He was like a shepherd, you know, hundreds of shapes going on different directions, getting him on a road. You know, it is wonderful how he summarized everything so simply. So first of all, let us ask Dr. Basudev, sir, you want to add something or, or we'll go for the question and answer session, sir. Uh, yes, thank you, Professor Bide. <laughs> Only you can do it. 
uh, it was such a difficult job uh, to cover up all the psychotherapies in a particular session and you did splendidly <clears throat> it was uh, uh, like it, it it should be very helpful for the post graduate trainees i believe that uh, to know about the various schools of psychotherapies and their uh, nuisances to come out with uh, eclectic uh, approach uh, uh, thank you once again uh, now amrit you can take up the questions uh, because we don't want to waste any further time time and uh, whatever time is left should be utilized uh, by the wisdom of uh, professor bide Dr. Bide was talking about cult cultures coming into psychotherapy. Where one question from a very senior psychiatrist, Dr. Subhas, is religion a form of psychotherapy, or better still, is psychotherapy a religion? Uh, psychotherapy is as much a religion as as a as a generic. Okay. Uh, psychotherapy is not a religion. Uh, adherent to any set principles because we have been talking about eclect eclecticism. So psychotherapy can replace religion in many minds because people take recourse to religion to ri right the wrongs of their lives very, very commonly going to a holy text or having a holy man give sane advice to set things right. So there are huge commonalities between religion and uh, psychotherapy, but to equate the two would be a... Uh, little uh, extrapolation that is not called for. Uh, another question. Uh, sir, Amrit, Amrit, please. No, carry on, Amrit. Yeah. So, so I was very well, one interesting concept to talk about Morata therapy. No, we, therapy. We see a lot of, uh, so you see a lot of our patients going to, you know, Kerala, going to places, you know, places where they are at peace, where they're with nature. Where, where, where they actually, I don't know whether they feel good about it or they don't feel good about it, but the whole concept of going there makes them feel good. So, you know, they're very expensive places. You know, they, they love to go there one month, one and a half months. Mm -hmm. and, and gradually we also see a lot of people, you know, after the pandemic going to nature, you know, for healing process. So why is this therapy not very popular and why it is more popular in Japan? Uh, I think you need to investigate that. I, I really haven't an answer, but I think there are a lot of people who do take a cross to that. And people going to ashrams where there is a salubrious environment very often serves very much the same purpose. The other important ingredient, which I did mention of Morita therapy, silence. And keeping your thoughts to yourself can sometimes do a lot of good, provided it is in a designed fashion, that you're not suppressing thoughts, but you are for some time containing yourself within. That is an important component of Morita therapy as well. Of course, oneness with nature, not spoiling nature is the other component of Morita therapy. And I remember from one of Woody Allen's movies where uh, uh, a go-getter type of person in an office, uh, he's not had the kind of success he wants. He tells, tells his boss, I'm gonna go for therapy. He said, go take a break. Go for a go for a vacation. That's all you need, and I think uh, that 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 is immense wisdom uh, that emanates in that particular context. Yeah, sir. Uh, so what I understand now is, uh, by eclecticism, do we mean that uh, whatever we are following a predominant school of thought and we are collecting wisdom from other groups and using it, uh, using it on the patients or you are doing whatever you want and uh, in, the, in, a, in, the, in the sense of therapy and uh, like taking up things, steps as you evolve. So is there a structure in this eclecticism or it is totally unstructured or what is it? Eclecticism provides you a platform to uh, invite various inputs. For example, those two vignettes that I had to quickly uh, uh, incorporate uh, there are dynamic factors over there. There are uh, uh, cognitive factors in one case. There are humanistic factors in both cases that have to be accommodated. Now, you have to have tasks and goals and the bond that we mentioned in the context of the working alliance. Those have to be clearly spelled. With those spelled, you can modify and choose from one of the schools. To, you may take a behavior therapy uh, paradigm for particular tasks. You may take a psychodynamic uh, uh, model for 
uh, another task and so forth. Within that much, you uh, leeway is given to you within that framework that you have a well-defined tasks, well-defined goals. And only within that you can manipulate. When, when you use a phrase like, uh, you can do what you like, it's a little dangerous because I've seen sometimes uh, when I was a senior resident in uh, Nimhans, there, there were uh, certain uh, residents who were really doing what they wanted and closeted with a patient for a long enough to justify their having been absent from other work to be taken up. Now, this kind of thing is something you have to guard against. Sometimes, unwittingly, therapists engage in banter, in social conversation, just to make a patient feel comfortable. That might serve a minuscule purpose to begin with in establishing rapport, but that becomes a major thread of uh, interaction. And that is really a waste of time, especially for the patient, because he's the guy who's going to eventually pay the price for it. It is also not wise for the uh, therapist if he's unwittingly being engaging in that. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, bond homie that is generated is not nearly enough to solve the problems that are at hand. Okay, sir. So, so, so uh, isko aise bolne ki we are uh, sort of converting a two-dimensional structure into a three-dimensional structure by adding various viewpoints. We are looking at the problem from various angles and whichever is suitable as per the therapy, we are taking right. it up. You might be governed, like I said in the Sanskrit Subhashit, you might be, uh, I, I lean towards uh, humanistic and reality therapy more than the others, but I also find great value in certain psychodynamic principles. So when I see a particular case and I, the defense mechanisms come bubbling up to me as they very often do, then I focus on those. In a particular case, I know that this person uh, needed proper disciplining in his early life and the lack of that has caused it, I would go to a behavior therapy model. Depending on each case, you will have to, you'll have to cut your coat according to your cloth as the cliche goes. Sir, and on the negative aspect, suppose I don't know a certain uh, part of therapy and so since I don't know, I shift to the other thing. So uh, do people use eclecticism uh, to uh, hide their gaps in the knowledge? Uh, <laughs> big, big, big words are always a good way of getting away. To that extent, it might be true. But I think that is not being really eclectic. That is being lost in a dark room. So I think in, in, in okay. such an instance, if you're not able to make a headway, it is sensible to take the opinion of a fellow professional who might have better insights into that particular case. Instead of saying that, I don't know what to do, I'll leave it with meaty meaty talk and leave it with me. Sorry, if I should not break into Hindi. I, I know I'm from the South and it's resented over here quite a bit, but that's, that's what it is. Okay, thank you. So, meaty meaty baato se bachna zara is the song you'd like to think of here. There was one important yeah. question that came up uh, that really strikes me is somebody who uh, uh, Subhash Pradhan asks, should psychotherapists be undergoing psychotherapy before giving psychotherapy? Yes, I yes. think that's such, that a, a, such a wonderful yeah, 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 question. Yes, yes, that is such a wonderful question. And this is advocated in most training centers where the, the, the when psychotherapy is being taught, each of the people learning the, the uh, process is also undergoing a process himself of being governed. Uh, Freud emphasized this in one of his uh, more readable and sensible, all of all, Freud is entirely readable, but he emphasized that you cannot be a psychoanalyst without having undergone psychoanalysis yourself. It's a different matter than in our country, the first uh, child psychiatrists uh, were people trained by people who did not have a qualification in uh, child psychiatry, but they were uh, they were grand dams of the field anyway, Dr. Savita and Dr. Shobha. That's how child psychiatry came about. But somewhere you have to make a start. Now, ideally, anybody undergoing training in psychotherapy or wanting to be a psychotherapist should undergo psychotherapy himself and un uh, uh, unmask himself to a supervisor. But all this is generally recorded in some fashion. And the entire process is governed by a board which looks at various people undergoing training in psychotherapy. So I fully agree with Dr. Pradhan over there that psychotherapists undergoing, uh, undertaking psychotherapy should undergo psychotherapy themselves. Because sometimes, and I find this particular, I'm sorry, I'm uh, where I saw of see, uh, cognitive, cognitive behavior. Behavior. I find people with such warped cognitions trying to administer cognitive behavior therapy. I, I'm not negating the usefulness of cognitive behavior therapy. But I think you have to get your house in order before giving advice on uh, housekeeping. 
perfect answer sir <laughs> sir we have a question from dr bhavesh uh, sir for identity crisis and when personality isn't formed completely maybe because of some psychiatric disorder or maybe we have intervened little early what type of therapy you should go for and how is the question dr bhavesh is we have little bhavesh uh, nice to see you uh, can you i'm not sure i got the question bhavesh can you ask the question yeah, yes. sir can, can we have him ask the question possible no yes sir i am unmuting him bhavesh bhai bhavesh unmute Okay. Uh, what was the question again? I'm going to go ahead. Read me the question. I can't see it. Uh, yeah, sir. Sir, he is asking that. Uh, <coughs> someone minute. For identity crisis, sir. Mm -hmm. And when personality isn't formed completely, maybe because of any psychiatric disorders, what type of therapy you should go for and how? It's a little. Uh, I think this is a quasi psychotic kind of state of yes. having that degree of disturbance. So I would not rely only on psychotherapy, though I think. what we should be aiming for is reconstructive therapy which is also insight oriented and i think we should have this person adequately cognitively uh, cognitively aware, uh, uh, aware to recognize where his personality is not adequately maturely formed guide him step by step through didactic directive therapy to get those components of his therapy of his personality in order for example it can be a simple issue like uh managing uh finances it can be a minor issue like getting on with other family members in the house over here one one uh, favorite uh, uh psychotherapy that i did not mention in passing psychodrama can be very very useful role playing can 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 be a good strategy in helping such people and having them do go uh, what i call a video technique where they show different behaviors like a video director and take the best take of the lot replay it over and over again so that that is properly reinforced in their subconscious that that helps a lot bhavesh did i make sense to you please say yes i uh, told you yes sir, sir dr subhas has asked another question that is a little controversial maybe that does psychotherapy really work with the exception of cbt do we have evidence and what are the limitations of psychotherapy research so oh, there is there, there is a lot of uh, literature on this and uh, we know the famous statement of icing that psychotherapy is usually bunkum that it is very dismissible uh, i think uh, icing and rachman were the people who gave this notion to us uh, if i'm not mistaken in the early 60s subsequent work has clearly shown how will you measure the effectiveness of psychotherapy if maladaptive behaviors maladaptive emotions maladaptive interactions have gone away or at least been reduced i would say psychotherapy works so there is enough literature to suggest that different forms of psychotherapy with different patients have worked independent researchers not practicing a particular form of psychotherapy have looked at this what's so great about cognitive behavior therapy working and I, I mean I'm again a little that that works and the others don't i have had people going for cognitive therapy because the boss said they should go for cognitive therapy who have no distorted cognitions at all cognitive therapy has its place it's a wonderful form of therapy but don't overuse it and don't believe it's a panacea for god's sake if you have faulty cognitions then cognitive therapy has a huge huge place in setting things right but then the psychodynamic people will say we are talking about defense mechanisms and converting unhealthy defense mechanisms to healthy ones That's also there. Yeah, so there's a question in the chat box. Uh, what, uh, which combination of therapies could be best for dealing with immature defenses? <coughs> and second part is how to overcome the counter transferences. Counter transference. Uh, counter transference is usually a red flag. If you, if if the uh, uh, counter transference is leading to a degree of even mental uh, erotic intimacy, then the best thing to do is gently but firmly terminate the therapy with yourself and transfer to another therapist that is very very important if counter transference is just the fact that you lend each other books i personally don't find this hugely objectionable i find that some people become excessively dependent on rich patients this is something again totally objectionable and we have to that's why it's important that a good therapist should be able to draw the boundaries 
and not only draw the boundaries, but impose them on himself or herself and the uh, client or patient. That is uh, very important. Uh, what was the first part of the question? The second part was a counter transference. Uh, a person is having immature defenses. Yeah, so. I, I, immature defenses is first to have them accepted through case, uh, sorry, to, through examples of behavior that you narrate to them that you, you, you acted like this in this situation. Does this strike you as a healthy response? Then we negotiate what would be a healthy response and can we substitute here? Here again, role playing and uh, uh, psychodrama based therapies would be very, very useful. Almost always for immature defenses, we need demonstration of healthy defenses and how they could uh, bring about a better outcome in the long run. That, that is important. And sir, uh, what sort of patients or clients, uh, clients are we talking about? Uh, whom we are dealing with. Uh, so, what used so, to be called neurotic uh, patients is uh, largely what we are talking about. To some extent, personality disorder, but usually the cluster A type of personalities, uh, B and C are much more difficult to deal with, but those also need psychotherapy more than they need any physical form of intervention. So uh, that's where we are. And sir, you mentioned in your presentation, uh, what sort of patients or- Also, clients... one, one, one minute, drug abuse. Yeah. Substance abuse is one area where multimodal therapy is extremely useful. You need behavior therapy, you need psychodynamic therapy, and very commonly, we know family therapy is needed. The last is the least successful because families are sometimes so bitter about the uh, habit that they don't, they are not very willing to participate. Of course, there are wonderful stories like uh, the TTK Foundation where uh, family therapy has been incorporated into the therapy for uh, uh, addiction. Yeah, sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, uh, uh, sir, uh, you were talking about the clients or patients. Which patients are uh, more easy to see? Uh, some difficult patients are there. So uh, there is a general notion that the patient who are landing up from villages, we all of us, most of us like to see them. Those who are from nearby, those who are asking too much questions, do hurt, uh, too much inclusive. So sir, your comments on this. What are, uh, uh, which patients do you prefer? To avoid and which pref uh, uh, do you prefer to see? I, or, I, or... I have absolutely no urban rural uh, uh, bias of any kind. Uh, my my uh, main uh, my, my radar is up for receptivity. How receptive are they to the idea that I could help them? If they're not receptive, it's a challenge and I try to take up challenges to say that I, I will render this person through my communication to be a little more receptive than I've managed. Very commonly, from the rural setup, since you brought that up, it is relationship issues. Not the least, the mother-in-law, the national villain, mother-in-law issues. This is, this is a very common paradigm that we have to deal with. Even in urban areas, we do, but we won't dwell on that currently. The other is now becoming more and more common about preoccupation with material well-being and how otherwise committed, uh, altruistically oriented rural people are becoming more and more materialistic cannot blame them at the same time, and you cannot cross certain limits. At the same time, you need to tell them to not lose their human values for which they have been treasured in, in various strata, in various segments of society. I think uh, I, I wouldn't go by just urban or rural, but uh, Savita's poem uh, detailed what Dr. V.K. Verma has described as an ideal patient for psychotherapy. I wish, since it's in Hindi, I wish you could you would get hold of it and read it. It's, it's truly marvelous. In fact, she presented it at Lucknow where uh, Dr. Salman Akhtar read his poems as well. And sir, would you say that psychoeducation is a, uh, would you elevate it to a form of psychotherapy? Or psychoeducation is, is an important component of all dealing with uh, uh, psychiatric illness of any kind, whether neurotic or more importantly, uh, psychotic or uh, psychobiological dysfunctions or addictions. Everywhere psychoeducation would be. I didn't bring up psychoeducation because it's a totally non-controvertible uh, area where all of us have to uh, engage in. And this is where our colleagues from psychology and uh, psychiatric social work can do great work because we are a little more pressed for time if you will allow a slight uppityness over here. Okay. Sir, Amrit, sir, I have a question. Yeah, I'll ask the last question then we'll shut down. So somebody has uh, you know, put a question in the chat box. Personally, the, somebody has texted me. Uh, sir, I have a long cherished question. And can you please ask to Dr. Bhidda? I told yes. 
So can a bad human being make a good psychotherapist? <laughs> From what context the bad human being is? But this is the question somebody wanted to ask. It's long cherished. Uh, can a bad human being make a good psychotherapist? It's in my personal chat, sir. Uh, no, I'm not looking for that. It's a very interesting question because uh, I think uh, the masks we wear can vary a lot. And different people have been unmasked. Jules Masserman, by the way, whom I looked up to so much, eventually had to face charges of sexual abuse of uh, patients and he died in ignominy, though the case was settled out of court and all that. So I don't know whether I call him a bad human being because he indulged in one wrongdoing. I, I don't believe there are out and out bad people, even in any political party, forgive my saying this. Uh, I, I, I believe that everybody has the potential if they're willing to Darpan ko dekha tumne jab jab kiya singar. Darpan ko dekhna zaruri hai to check with yourself about where you need to change, and then you can become that much of a good human being. I don't know what the question really, the questioner really implies. It's an intriguing question for me, and I would love to engage in a dialogue with this individual who's asked this very searching question about can a bad individual be a bad individual? I, I don't know if it's immoral, immoral in, in, in his sexual life, but uh, very good as a father to his children. It does happen. Uh, monetarily very corrupt, but uh, uses a lot of the money for charity. It can happen. So I don't know if anybody is totally, totally, totally bad. I don't know what that means. Thank you, sir. Thank you so, so much. Sir. If, I summarize, if I summarize it, uh, I should be uh, flexible. I should be undoctrinated, not indoctrinated. I should learn the rules and then I should forget the rules and keep on working. Quite well put. Amrit, over to you. Not bad, Ali. Not bad, Ali. Thank you. So over to the chairperson, sir. Oh, uh, the chairpersons, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Bide, Ajit, fantastic uh, presentation. We have learned a lot from you, especially psychobiology, group therapy, uh, variables in the person, <coughs> analyzed or treated and variables in the self that have to be kind of this thing. Thank you for telling us about the Indian contribution. That is Dr. Bose, Sudhir Kakkar and Salman Akhtar. You can't forget them because we usually look towards the West, but they are over here. And all the pluses and minuses of the various therapies that you have put across, it's a sure good learning for us and we'll carry this with us. My question last to you is, you must be a guru. Do you have chelas under you who will follow your this thing? Uh, I don't have a single chela, but I interact with a lot of younger psychiatrists with whom we don't have a formal, I don't do any formal uh, training, but we do discuss cases. I have about six psychiatrists with whom I interact and who liaise with me. I uh, was uh, keen on starting something called a valent group, uh, which one of my former students now operates. She tried to do it in Nim hands. I think it was functional for some time, but I don't think it's functional anymore. I, I would love to start that kind of a group, even online. Uh, if people are keen on it, we can do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ajit. Vajdev, sir. Uh, thank you, Professor Abhidev, once again for a wonderfully lucid talk on psychotherapy, eclectic approach. I think to be a uh, successful psychotherapist, you need to uh, apply eclectic approach, uh, which will be uh, uh, more acceptable to the uh, patient or the client, and uh, uh, it should be effective one. Uh, once again, uh, uh, thank you. And I think uh, we all uh, have been enriched uh, by this presentation. Thank you, sir, once again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Tufan, sir. Dr. Tufan, sir. Uh, sir, please unmute sir, yourself. Please unmute yourself. For your... Thank you, Ajit, for your nice presentation. Quite enriching. I have to make two only simple observations. As I feel, all of us are in some way eclectic. Eclecticism is there in all our approaches. When you see a patient, not only the psychodynamic school, different schools of psychotherapy, 
our biological school, everything comes to our mind, which forms the construct, which writes the prescription. It's different that one can, uh, we mostly go in for writing prescription, but if there is some amount of un unknown eclecticism, all the approaches. It was an example of eclecticism only. But in a particular case in eclectic uh, psychotherapy, I believe a person has to be quite profound in different methods of psychotherapeutic schools. And he, as he proceeds with the patient, at times he may think, might have thought that in this stage I should do this sort of psychotherapy, but he finds the other will be better. It is a dynamic process. I, and that person, any person, suppose I think that I will practice eclectic psychotherapy. And I have to be profound in one, two, three, four, five, six mood of psychotherapeutic schools, not just knowing as a textual reader. And as I feel, there is a dearth of such experts. That's all. This is just my observation. But eclecticism, I dearly believe in it. I have made my backdrop that only. Thank you. Thank you. And thank, you. At least, and thank you. Thanks a lot, Ajit. Glad you to be here. Thank you sir. for having me. Sir. Sir, now the I'm formal ready. thank you, sir. Formal thank you, sir. Sir, Dr. Ajit Bide, thank you so much. You know, you 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 were ready to come on the third episode, and we apologize for delaying it a little. So excuse in that, and maybe we'll be calling you later also, sir. Ajit, Dr. Ajit Bide is the Colgate face. If you ever you know brush your teeth, always remember okay. Dr. Ajit Bide, sir. Please go and watch the video of Dr. Bide. He is our James Bond, our superstar, a past president, and is the man who made, you know, if you look at Section 377 being removed, sir is the man responsible for it. So thank you so much, sir. I worked a lot with him very closely, and and and, and we, I really appreciate your contribution to Indian psychiatry, sir. Thank you so much, Dr. Charles Pinto, sir, such a senior man. Thank you, sir, for coming and sharing our session. My pleasure, Dr. Bas, Dr. Basudev, sir. He has taught me psychopharmacology, let me be very honest. And today when he's chairing a session in psychotherapy, it makes me feel proud. One of the most brilliant clinicians I have seen is my one of my gurus and, and I, I have learned a lot from him in the postings. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank, thank you, Dr. Tufan, sir. Thank you, Aleem. You have been very sober and good today. Thank you to the audience. We have more than 400, we have more than 400 registrations. 250 logins and a peak of 180. That is very, very good uh, once the lockdown has, has been removed. Thank you to all our audience who are very, very loyal. We have a great set of people who are always there asking questions. And, and I think Dr. Bide's presentation was too exhaustive today. He, he managed to bring in a lot of things into it. You know, getting them concise is very, very difficult. And, and he did a great job. So, so the number of questions were little less in those sense. Maybe he was much more clear than anybody else was. Thank you, Torin, for supporting us. Uh, and my many, many thanks to IPS Odisha State Bench. We have never interfered. Our president, our secretary, and our you know CME chairperson. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Torin. Thank you all. Have a great weekend. Good night. See you again next week. Same time, but with a different James Bond. <laughs> Thank you. Thank good you. night, all. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Good night. Good night. Good night, Good night. everyone. So kind, Good night, sir. kind of you. So kind of all people who have come here. And next week, same time, same Thursday, we'll be having another topic. That is Maybe we will have a different different designation for our chairperson. You know,